Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be breaking down the structure of Black Panther. And I'm going to be using the three act structure specifically looking at it through the lens of the eight sequence story structure. I go over the eight sequence story structure in depth in my video that I have linked in the description box below. But you won't have to watch that video first to get an understanding of where we're going today. That video will help you get a deeper understanding as to how to use the eight sequence story structure for your own story. And as a reminder, the eight sequence story structure is something that has been used in Hollywood for over a hundred years. It has also been adopted by the publishing industry and it allows writers to sequence their stories into manageable chunks because act two tends to be a sticking point for many writers and it tends to be too long to fill up adequately. With the eight sequence story structure, we can mitigate that problem by having four sections within act two, two sections within act one, and two sections within act three. This is roughly what it looks like. I'm gonna show you this on screen right now. And here we can see that each of the sequences holds one of the major plot points towards the end of that particular sequence. In a way, that plot point can be considered the climax of its respective sequence. And likewise, each sequence will have a beginning, middle, end, the end containing that major plot point. On this channel, we go over all things writing and screenwriting. So if that's something that interests you, make sure you like and subscribe. And also make sure the notification bell's turned on. That way you're hit up every time I post a new video. There's gonna be spoilers, a lot of spoilers for Black Panther if for some reason you haven't seen the movie already. And if you haven't seen Black Panther, I highly recommend it. It's a great film. First, I definitely wanna say rest in peace to the late, great Chadwick Boseman. His loss is something that's definitely still felt within the community and around the world. I thought I would put this video together to commemorate Black Panther 2 coming out and to show you how we can take things from other pieces of art and use them within our own, particularly structure. So the goal of today's video will be to analyze the structure of Black Panther and see if we can get anything out of it that can help us when we create our own stories. And I rarely get to talk about this anymore, but the first time I was nominated for an award for my writing was for the Humanitas Prize. And when the news about that broke in Hollywood, it was published in the trades. And in case you don't know, the trades are an industry publications that are sent out in Hollywood. They tell all types of Hollywood news, whether it be uh, who's signed on to do a new picture, who's getting nominated for certain awards and things like that, who's gotten promoted at the executive level and any mergers or acquisitions that take place. I just thought it was so cool to be mentioned in an article with great films such as Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians. We were nominated in different categories, but it was for the same award. And it was just a really cool feeling. And that was one of the first times I was publicly recognized for my writing. Okay, so back to the story breakdown. The first thing you need to know is what this film is about. Black Panther can be confused for just a simple superhero movie, but I promise you it's anything but. This movie focuses on some great political and social issues. The external conflict of the story does start with the focus on whether or not Black Panther will be able to find Ulysses Claw, that's the bad guy's name, find him and retrieve the vibranium which he has stolen. That external conflict does get shifted to him keeping the crown or retaking the crown from Eric Killmonger later in the story. But the internal conflict of Black Panther is the same throughout. And really, it's a simple question of will T'Challa, the newly crowned king, will he lead Wakanda in a new political direction? You see, Wakanda is the wealthiest country on earth within the MCU. And since they were founded, they kind of kept to themselves and off of the world stage. They set out all the major conflicts when they could have probably helped, they definitely could have participated more in the history of mankind. So now T'Challa throughout this film is thinking about whether or not it's his role 
to lead his country in helping the rest of the world, using their resources to reach out and help other people. There's a very interesting thing about the structure of this film. You'll see external conflict scenes, scenes where he's actually fighting or trying to fight either Ulysses Claw or Eric Killmonger. Now, these scenes are immediately followed with scenes that focus always on the internal conflict. So you're going to get kind of a weave between the A and the B stories. And various characters pop up in that B story of his internal conflict to kind of advise him or give him different perspectives on whether or not he should lead Wakanda in that direction. This internal conflict is highlighted by the belief system of Eric Killmonger. You'll see that now as we go through the sequences. So let's start with sequence one. Sequence one leads us all the way through the other side of the inciting incident. The inciting incident of Black Panther is T'Challa fighting M'Baku and winning, thus being crowned King of Wakanda. It's important to keep in mind that what's happening in each plot point is one thing, and then the visual depiction of that thing is another. For instance, as silly as it sounds, they didn't have to fight to decide who could have been crowned king. They could have played a game of chess or they could have played even rock, paper, scissors. But these type of things don't quite fit the genre of Black Panther. Instead, we have a ceremonial type of fight which actually fits the genre much better you're going to want to think about the visual depictions of your plot points because if they fit firmly for the genre and the type of story you're telling, then they'll be great. You can always heighten the feel of the plot points by simply making the visual representation much more elaborate. For instance, they were fighting on the side of a waterfall. What if they were fighting on raised platforms over a ravine? It wouldn't change the plot point itself, it would just change the visual depiction. Me personally, I like the waterfall and I like what they did. I think it really shows us the beauty of Wakanda because you can see the skyline and the sunset in some of the fights. So throughout this breakdown, I'm going to show you that there is a distinct thing that is happening in the plot point, And then there's also the visual representation. And keep in mind, there are infinite possibilities for the visual representation. However, you should have just one clear thing happening in your plot point. After T'Challa is crowned, we immediately start to go into some of those internal conflict scenes. He starts to talk to people around his kingdom. He talks to uh, Wakabi. He talks to Nakia. And these people, well, specifically his love interest, she kind of acts as the voice to his internal conflict. She says things like Wakanda can help itself and help the outside world. She has a kind of firm, she's like three steps ahead of T'Challa in this understanding that Wakanda can do more on the world stage. And it is in this sequence that we lead up to the major question of act two and that's Will T'Challa catch Ulysses Claw and retrieve the vibranium and bring Ulysses Claw to justice for his crime? The question of Act 2 should give you direction for your story and tell us what we're going to be focusing on. Black Panther does do a switcheroo because we think that Ulysses Claw is the main antagonist. However, he is almost like a henchman working under Killmonger, although <laughs> Ulysses Claw himself doesn't even know that. Okay, so now we head into Act 2A, and Act 2B starts after the midpoint, but we're going to be in the first sequence now of Act 2A, and that's going to lead us to the other side of the first pinch point. Here we start to see the fun in games. We see the tech and all the cool things Black Panther can do. We see Shuri and how smart she is and her skill set. And this is kind of like the promise of the premise in this section. We get to see Black Panther. This is what the kids came for. This is what we were all promised in the trailers. In this sequence, we get the car chase scene 
and the run-in with Ulysses Claw at the underground gambling rink, gambling casino, whatever you want to call it. But there's fight scenes. There's a great one shot that we get to see all the different fighting styles between T'Challa, Koye, and Nakia. In addition, this takes place in South Korea, or at least it's depicted as taking place in South Korea. And it's just a really a lot of spectacle, a lot of things to watch. But to prove my point, it didn't have to take place in South Korea. The same thing could be happening in Australia, in Sydney. The same thing could be happening in South Africa. All that needs to be focused on is T'Challa's pursuit of Ulysses Claw. And we need to see all the cool things that Black Panther can do in this sequence. So when you write your story, make sure that you really do play with the fun and game section. Actually have fun. Write out 20 things that you can do with the premise of the story that you're constructing. Now, Black Panther doesn't manage to capture Ul Ulysses Claw. He actually does get away in this sequence. And that kind of leads us into the internal conflict portion where we see that Wakabi is kind of mad about this. Actually, he's very mad about this because uh, Ulysses Claw has killed Wakabi's parents and he was promised by T'Challa justice. It is at this moment that Wakabi looks into T'Challa's eyes and tells him that he's just like his father in terms of the way that he rules. And this is not something that T'Challa wants to hear because he's actually trying to do a better job than his father did. Now, that's not to say his father did a bad job, but there were definitely things about his regime that weren't right that T'Challa is trying to fix. And we do see some of that change start to take place because Everett Ross is an CIA agent that has taken a bullet for I believe he took a bullet for Nakia and they actually brought this outsider into Wakanda in order to save him. That's something that his father would have never done. T'Challa's dad would have never done that. And it's kind of interesting because we see a little bit of change in characters and then they're rewarded with something very horrible happening to them. And that's kind of something that you really want to maintain in storytelling. You kind of want it to feel a little bit like a roller coaster where there's ups and downs. Now, T'Challa making the slight change of bringing Everett Ross to Wakanda despite being told that it's a bad idea by his general, that's a step in, I guess, the right direction of change, at least, for T'Challa. And he is then rewarded by the horrible news from Forrest Whitaker's character, where he tells him that T'Challa's father actually killed T'Challa's uncle. Not only that, but... They left behind a child. That child grew up to be Eric Killmonger. So to be clear, T'Challa's father, in trying to maintain the secret of Wakanda, ruthlessly left behind a child and killed that child's father. So he left him, he left the orphan behind. And now that orphan is coming back for revenge. This, of course, is weighing heavy on T'Challa's heart. And this is where Nakia, she has a great line. She, she's the voice of internal conflict. She tells him straight up, you get to decide what type of king you want to be. And just to hammer home the point at the apex, the climax of this sequence, sequence four, Eric Killmonger comes to Wakanda with Ulysses Claw dead. He kills Ulysses Claw, brings the body to Wakanda. This is something that Black Panther himself wasn't able to do. And while doing so, he tells the royal family of Wakanda what T'Challa already kind of knows, that he is, in fact, the kid that was left behind by T'Challa's dad. So in this sequence, we have Eric Hillmonger revealing that he is T'Challa's cousin and he has the right to fight for the crown. This could have been depicted in a lot of ways, but they chose to do it in this fashion, in the throne room, it could have been out in the fields, it could have been in a different country, but this is the way that they chose to go. I think, again, this is a good choice because we do get to see the throne room and we do get to see the reactions from all the key political players of Wakanda. 
at this point, I definitely want to talk about something, and that's the customs of Wakanda and how important it is to the people. There are so many times in this movie where characters don't have to behave in a particular way, but they do because they have a very strong sense of integrity towards their country, what their country stands for, and they just really follow these customs to a T. For instance, T'Challa doesn't have to entertain Eric Killmonger's claim for the throne. He could do away with him. He could get rid of him. And later, we have uh, M'Baku taking care of Black Panther. He doesn't have to do that, or I should say taking care of T'Challa. He doesn't have to do that either. There are so many times that the ruling, the people who are ruling do things that they don't have to, or the people I should say to have an advantage over someone. They don't take advantage of that situation. They actually honor the rules of their customs and their country. The only person who doesn't do that is Killmonger. And it kind of is the way we can see that he's a villain. For instance, after he is crowned later, he destroys all the heart-shaped herb. That's something that goes firmly against their customs. And even the other characters are very surprised that he does this because just because you're a king doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want just because you're in leadership. There are rules that you should follow because that's what helps their society perpetuate and be productive and be as great as they are. So now we have the fight, one of the best scenes I think in Black Panther between Eric Killmonger and T'Challa. And this is again at that waterfall area. And this time we don't have the whole country there to see. Again, this could be in a different location. They could be fighting in the mountains. They could be fighting in a valley. They could be fighting in a desert. And it would still have the same story beat being satisfied. But they chose to do it this way because it represents the customs of Wakanda the best as they have established that in the beginning scenes. T'Challa loses this fight against Eric Killmonger and in most stories, this would be considered the lowest point, the end of act two. However, in this particular story, it's around the midpoint, slightly after the midpoint. Because in the midpoint, we're gonna have news revealed and that's the news that Eric Killmonger is in fact T'Challa's cousin. And Killmonger eventually gets crowned after he does away with T'Challa and he declares war on the rest of the world. And that's, in fact, the climax of sequence number five. Sequence number five can often be thought of as the fallout of the midpoint. So as a result of Eric Killmonger uh, laying claim to the throne and eventually winning it, he is now going to try to have Wakanda rule the entire world. In sequence number six, we have the climax of it being T'Challa is revived. And this is one of those moments I was mentioning that a character did something that they didn't have to do. We see that M'Baku has preserved T'Challa and kind of held out hope that they could do something to eventually save him. And he didn't have to do that. But they do save T'Challa and give him the last that we know of, the last heart-shaped herb. And T'Challa, again, revisits the ancestral plane. And he tells his ancestors that they were all wrong. And this is one of the most powerful scenes, I think, in the story. It's one of a few times, very few times, where T'Challa raises his voice. And he tells all of their ancestors that they were wrong to abandon the world and not help the world. In particular, he tells them, he tells his father that he was wrong for abandoning Eric Killmonger. They cre he became a monster of their own creation. But this kind of seals the deal for the internal conflict. We know now that he's going to lead Wakanda forward in a new direction where they're going to be a better participant on the world stage. I really love this moment. He tells his ancestors no more. They're no longer gonna be waiting on the sidelines out of fear. They're gonna go forward 
and make sure that they do what is right. The greatest thing about these type of moments in stories is that when they occur, we know for sure that the hero is ready to actually win the fight. They have their whole mind and body in unison, complete, they're ready, the change arc is done, and now all that's left to do is beat the bad guy. And it should be said that even though Killmonger is going about things in the wrong way, he actually has some good things in his heart that he's trying to achieve. He just has a lot of anger built up for how life has treated him and the things that he's seen life do to other people. I think Killmonger's story is really a tragedy in that he probably would have been a completely different person he definitely would have been a completely different person had he been raised in Wakanda in a similar fashion to T'Challa. So yes, the climax of sequence seven is the actual climax of the movie and it's the fight of Eric Killmonger versus T'Challa. And it goes without saying, this is a Marvel movie so the action is very intense and the fight scene lasts for quite a long while. Something I wanted to mention about the moment where we thought that T'Challa died. Again, that moment usually happens at the end of Act 2, which I think Black Panther does a good job of catching us by surprise because we think it's too early for Black Panther to perish in the movie. And since it seemed like he does, and there's about, I want to say there's 56 minutes left in the movie, almost an hour left in a movie that's a little over two hours. It's... It's kind of crazy to think that the hero could actually disappear in the middle of the movie. But in this climax scene, we see them fighting. Also, Eric Killmonger fights against several different powerful women within Wakanda. And we have some of the tribes fighting against each other in a huge battle sequence. That's going to be the bulk of sequence number seven leading up to T'Challa defeating Eric Killmonger. So in sequence eight, we kind of see the new reality of T'Challa's rule. We see all the storylines kind of tied up, his love storyline. We see that he is starting to right some wrongs of the previous uh, ruling class, the pre previous regimes by doing things in the inner city in Oakland where Eric Killmonger is from. He actually bought that building. He bought other buildings in that neighborhood and he's kind of trying to make sure that it has more options, better developed things for the people who live there. He's also doing things with the UN and he makes an announcement that Wakanda is going to be using its resources to help out people. So this is really important because you could have shown the differences and how Black Panther T'Challa is going to go leading Wakanda forward. You could show that in many ways. He doesn't have to go back to Oakland where Eric is from. He doesn't have to do that. But I believe that's a really powerful scene because we see that he doesn't hate his cousin. He is trying to right the wrongs and he does feel bad that his cousin was left behind like that. So again, this is a moment where we see someone in this film do something great, do something morally right when they don't have to. And I think that is probably one of the best things about this film. So keep in mind, sequence eight is going to be your new norm. So the new norm for Wakanda going forward is to lead the world and be a great superpower within it. Let me know if you have any questions about going over these eight sequences. And the biggest thing I want you to take away from it is that you have these eight sequences and each of those main story beats are one thing, but how you depict them and the, the setting and the locations are a different thing. And you have infinite combinations and this is where creativity really does come into play. But I believe you want to stay within the bounds of the genre that you have presented at the beginning of the story. Studying the structure is a great start, but if you really want to understand the eight sequences, I'm going to show you how to do that in the video on screen now.